everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Black Tea. I am your host, Michelle Lawrence, and you are watching the podcast video series that is all about Black women in advertising presented by Muse by Clio. I am honored today to be here with the one, the only Rihanna Johnson. Not to be confused with the other only Rihanna. So happy to have you with us today. Uh, please do tell the people what you do and where you're based. Oh, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I work in, in advertising and I work actually as a new business. So I am the VP Director of Growth Strategy at Deutsche LA. So I'm based here in LA. I'm a West Side kid all day, every day. Um, right. I lived um, in New York for a while, but then I came back home to, to LA. I want to start out with um, asking you about Three's a Crowd. What is Three's a Crowd and why did you found it? So like I, like I mentioned, I lived in New York for a little bit. And when I came back home to LA, um, I realized there was a deficit of a black creative advertising community. And instead of me complaining about it and saying, we don't have a community for, for black people who work in advertising, mm -hmm. why not make one? Um, and I saw that there was communities, you know, in music and in film and in television and that sort of thing. But it just wasn't a space for people who were black and work in, worked in advertising. Mm -hmm. And so a friend of mine and myself, he worked in production. Another friend of mine, she worked in production as well, decided to say, OK, let's let's actually make the community. We didn't even know what that community was going to be when we first started it. We just knew that we needed a, a safe space to talk authentically about issues that may have happened at work, issues we may be struggling with personally, and quite frankly, issues that are ha happening in our country kind of thing. And so it started with about maybe three, seven of us got together. It was enough to feed us on one pizza. That's how small it was at that time. And we had these things that we call soul sessions. And we just kind of talked about microaggressions, um, things that were celebratory. I remember Justin, uh, the other co-founder, he was at an agency at that time and wanted to start his own company and him talking talking to us about it and saying, how should he talk to his wife and, and that sort of thing. And it just became this Black creative collective of just authentically being ourselves and figuring out a way to leverage our voices within advertising. I and so that. me- it was, it's just, it just organically happened that way. It makes me think of the spiral group from the seventies, that group of artists in the black community that that came together and just built, build each other up in a turbulent yeah. time. Um, so I love that for the advertising community. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and it wasn't like massive, let's be on social, let's do these things. It was just one person told another person, another person told another person and come to find out, what was really interesting when I looked at the members that were coming, a lot of them were people who were from a different part of the country and they just wanted community. Mm -hmm. you know, they could be from Chicago, they could be from New York, they could be from Florida, and they were in search of connection with folks. And so we realized this is way bigger than just our jobs. This is about people really wanting a family and a home base and a creative family mm -hmm. and a professional family. So I would say um, we started that in 2018 um, before all of the civil unrest. And I mean, with civil unrest is gold. I mean, it, <laughs> it's, it's, it's every year. It's every day. Kind of thing. Right. <laughs> um, and so our mailing list got up to about 150 people from people just coming in and telling each other and that sort of thing to the meetings got really big um, with so many different people coming. And so I started to think about how can this become something that has a mission, has a vision, have something that we can shape it around. Yeah. And so I broke it out into three pillars. The first is how do we use our voice effectively in advertising to make an impact? The second being, can we make unapologetically Black content where it's like, whatever we want to say, we don't have an approval, we don't have a client, it's just whatever we want to say or do. Mm -hmm. And the last one is how do we live in our legacy? Um, we know that there's um, folks that are just like us, kids, some of us have kids. How do we make sure that we're showing up every day living for that next generation of folks? And so we started initiatives underneath all three of them, which yeah. that led to, 
you know, some other things that we've been working on. But in a nutshell, M for 13 is, excuse me, uh, Three's a Crowd is, is pretty much a Black creative collective that comes together and uses our voices in any way we can to shape our voices in advertising. So what is in for 13 and why 13? Like what's up with that number? So the the first pillar of three is a crowd is how do we use our voices? And mm-hmm. so in 2020, when folks were actually kind of like, let's hear different perspectives. Let's hear what people are talking about kind of thing. Mm-hmm. We decided to say, well, let's make a pledge for, for agencies to change their black leadership because we realized the hole in advertising was more black people in leadership. Perfect. So me working in new business and, and, and so many other folks within Threes of Crowd being on pitches, we turned it into a pitch, meaning where we wrote a brief from Black America saying we want leadership to be 13%, which is the black US population. So we want every leadership team to look like the country we live in. Very we fair. Want- not Very even fair. Asking to take it over. Not even no. <laughs> people, like not even 50-50. It's just like, let's just make it representative of the country. Well, the country we live in. That's it all, right? Very reasonable. <laughs> and then we added a, a deadline. Let's do it by 2023. Mm-hmm. And that was back in 2020. And okay. we knew the, we knew the goal was extremely aggressive. And we knew the deadline was extremely aggressive. But we did it on purpose because if we were a client and a client came and said, I want to reach millennial moms by 13% in three years, we would figure it out. We would do some, we would try anything possible, right. try to meet that goal. Even okay. if we got to 8% and even if we did it in five years, it mm-hmm. still would be something that we can work towards sort of thing. So we intentionally made it that aggressive. And so Info 13 became a pledge that had a goal and a deadline but it also became a community of agencies that took the pledge that now they can work on one goal and one deadline all together. So now we have like an in for 13 agency community that we manage to kind of like, how do we get there? What's the real problems? Are the real problems retention? Are the real problems the idea that people are being promoted in a certain way? People don't have a lot of visible projects where they're pushing to the next level of their career. These are the real problems as to why the 13% isn't being reached kind of thing. And so we've been digging in deep with them. We have about 20, 25 agencies that are in, and we've been talking and working with them over the course of the last two and a half years. Yeah. Thus far, we started at about collectively at about 3% Black leadership. We've gotten folks to about 6%. So it is sort of, it's it's a long game with what we've been doing, but at the same time, the thinking and the wheels are turning where people are starting to figure, oh, I got to do some real internal work before that, that representation goal will even be met. So, yeah. so yeah, that's it for 13. I'm hearing a lot too about um, the, the sort of gap in the middle. Like we hear yeah. whenever there's a push for diversity, there's a lot of hiring, a lot of it sometimes at the junior level. Um, or, um, you know, there are not that there are not people in the middle in that senior upper, you know, creative strategy, uh, creative, um, tier before you get to like, you know, management, there's people working, you know, all across the country in those roles, but a lot of them are in multicultural shops. You know, they're not getting looks a lot of times from some of these general market places, And then, uh, when they're looking for leadership, all of a sudden they're pulling in people from, you know, uh, various, uh, places and there's not always necessarily the, they're not always set up for success. So the expectation is that you come in and you immediately know how to speak our language, do our ad stuff, you know, woo our clients, you know, sell, 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 whatever the like vibe is at that place. But, you know, how are we getting people to that point, especially if we're looking, which we should be looking outside of the normal career paths of typical advertisers and looking, you know, outside of the ad schools and outside of the the, the normal uh, funnels that bring people into our industry for more diverse experiences, people that have, you know, some, you know, maybe some different skills that can convert over into advertising. How are we setting them up for success so that when they get into the role, um, there's a higher probability that they actually succeed and that they actually do well in the role and that their skills, you know, shine 
uh, in a way that actually builds up the business. And, you know, I think that's something that has to be thought out a lot too. Um, and I think that's really where the inclusion part of DEI comes in that a lot of people are like really heavy on the diversity, but then they forget about how to make the place actually inclusive and how to make it so that everyone from different walks of life can find success there. So I think that's uh, a beautiful initiative and, you know, that's really dope. Uh, I, I'm really curious about what is next up for um, for these two organizations, for Theresa Crowd and then for the N4 N13 uh, initiative. Well, I'm so, I love everything you said because that's kind of where we're at with N4 13. It's that middle portion that it's a ret it's it's a retention problem where you're not really fostering them to include in the space. And the reason why I say that when you mentioned the question about what's next is how do we help you? Yeah. Agencies? Because the work now has become internally. Mm -hmm. It becomes something where we can continue to have the conversation and give you tidbits of like some of the information that you shared. But when does it become something that's ingrained in your culture with your management team, as well as just on autopilot and HR and, and in the thinking, because what we're giving is things that you can do um, process, but also behavior has to match it. So now how do we turn in for 13 more into something that is more, we check in with you once a year at this point, or we become something that has given you all this great information. And now you have to kind of put it within your agency to figure it out. Yeah. At the beginning of the year, I sent out a survey just asking folks, what did they want help with? Like, how can we actually show up for you? And it kind of went right where, where you just went in terms of like, where are we going with this? So I think in for 13 is going to continue to remain and keep its community but keep the resources and tools and things that we've developed over the last two and a half years and just make sure that folks have accessibility to that and be the constant reminder that this work is never done kind of thing. Because if we have another guest speaker, if we have another summit, if we have another conversation about it, at this point, what is it that you're going to do that's right. going to make you completely uncomfortable within yeah. the space? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And honestly, just to, just one of the things that has not happened in this conversation, which is why I think it gets kind of just um, stagnant, is how do you do this work and you've never retrained your clients? Because mm -hmm. clients have yeah. been used to working at the speed of light. Yep. So you're still trying to manage a business and then you're trying to change your entire culture within, internally. And clients have the same problem we have. Mm -hmm. So- when is it going to be a rectification as to how do we deal with the speed of all of this advertising stuff that we do? And then also everyone is changing their culture at the same time. And then at that point, now we're talking about money. Now we're talking about expectations. Now we're talking about uh, campaigns. It's a bigger conversation that that is not being had, but then we're expected to do all this other internal work. And until the clients can start getting on board with that thinking and do it themselves, and then have the same expectations for their agencies. We're going to keep having these conversations of like, how do I manage the business on autopilot? And then I also have to do this other part of it too, you know, and that's, that's way above in for 13, but at the same time, it's something that those conversations aren't being talked to together. You have three as a crowd, you have in for 13, and then you have hex code black, you have better hoods and gardens. <laughs> My question is, how do you find the time? I assume you also like work. Like, what are the tips? What are the tips that you have for creating space for your passion projects? So I have, this is really so like, you won't even believe this. I have a book day planner. Okay. I, a, I, I don't do any of my personal projects on in like Outlook and Google. Yeah. Okay. I actually have a, and it's, it's actually here. It's called uh, the 30 day commitment book. And wow. I like literally every, it, the way that it's set up is you do a little piece every day. And so for the beginning of the month, it has like bubbles where you can go, okay, so for Hexco, what am I going to do? For Threes of Crowd, what am I going to do? For um, and for 13, what am I going to do for better hoods? What am I going to do? And then you like literally say, I'm going to do these two things or these three things. 
And then the next, you outline it by the week. My okay. mind has always kind of like been like a post-it person where I would have like six yeah. post across. Uh-huh. But this book has allowed me to just put it in one book. I am a very, I'm really good with time management. Yeah. I, I wake up really early. I do not stay up late. I'm not like that person that does, um, you know, all nighters. I, I My brain starts shutting off around 8, 830. Okay. Um, but it's just a little nugget every day of like, today is just going to be organizing this. Tomorrow is going to be emailing all of the agencies that the next day is going to be what are what are we going to do with better hoods or whatever it may be so it's just a nugget a day and it kind of ends up being like I just rewrote the whole playbook this whole month because I didn't know you know what I mean so then it's like an end goal but I just kind of chunk it down into little goals the problem that I think when I feel the most overwhelmed is when I try to do too much at one time where I'm I'm like, okay, over here, over here, over here, over here. Yeah. And then nothing gets done. <laughs> and then nothing gets done. It's just a matter of the time management. And I'm really good at knowing what I'm not good at. So I'm not good at Squarespace. No, I don't know how to build this stuff, but yeah. I know what's needed. So let me call the right person and okay. tell them exactly what I need help with. And I will pay for this. Because yeah. a lot of times people are, are very gun shy on like, I don't want to pay for, I want to be able to do everything. I can't. I need to be able to articulate what I need and, and have the person who knows how to do it, do it right. That's how I keep it all going. And it all kind of, I'm like that in my work as well. So it's like, I have six things. What am I going to do really well this week? And what am I going to do really well today? So then it feels like, Oh, I actually got some stuff done this week. And I, I make sure that I stay connected to that. I feel like you could put on a little bit of a clinic. I feel like I would go to the <laughs> clinic. Um, teach me how to how to have six pro- passion projects in a day job. Um, <laughs> so you have been tapped in with the Black community in advertising for uh, some time now. And you have been officially tapped in via Threes of Crowds since 2018. So I want to know what are Black creatives really talking about by the water cooler, the proverbial water cooler? Yeah. And that's the hex code. That is what we talk about on hex code. We talk about those types of topics and they start with like, okay, why, what is wrong with hybrid work? That's one that's talked about a lot too. Like people like the idea of hybrid work because they don't have to shuck and jive as much. Yeah. Yeah. Get some time and, off from having to like assimilate. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. it's like it's draining. Yeah. And so, so that is being talked about at the water cooler. Um, also, mental health has been a big topic. Big topic. I'm, glad. Yes. I'm happy to hear that. It's been a big topic. And we're actually going to be rolling out in May a Black mental health series um, for Black creators. Okay. Managing those dualities of like, I know what's expected or what people may think or what 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 is that role as me as a Black person in the room, but then who am I really? And as a Black person in these spaces, you're always constantly managing those two perspectives. And so how does, how does that play to your mental health in terms of like, I'm so used to giving what people may think I need to do versus what, you know, who I really am as a Black person. And especially as a Black creator, how creative can you really be? Right. If you are trying to manage those dualities all the time. Yeah. So those are that's being talked about at the water cooler. We did a series um just this past uh an episode called uh, Martin Luther King versus Kendrick Lamar during MLK Day. The conversation was like we were giving we were paying respect to both of those great men, mm-hmm. but we were also dissecting the idea of we all love the the hope and the ambition and the drive and and how Dr. King saw the world how it could be, but when we also go to show up to work, everybody's trying to get their money in a bag. Yeah. So, and that's kind of what Kendrick is like: just let's ball out, let's get whatever you need, and you know, have no allegiance to anything, kind of thing. And I think those dualities exist in the in the workspace as well. Mm-hmm. And so I think. Um, us kind of talking about that and freeing ourselves like, am I uh, am I being real with myself because I kind of do want my bag, but then I also kind of live in this hopeful way as well. So we talked about that at the water cooler. We talked about what it means to be 
regular black because mm. someone was saying that they heard that term like oh you're 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 not regular black and it just turned into this like spiral conversation mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the good thing about all of these conversations is that I wanted folks to heal from these these conversations so on the podcast what we do is is we have the this random thoughts and all of these things. And, and we kind of use a lot of sound design to show like the distortion of like your thinking. And then we invite scholars. We have um, uh, a wonderful doc, Dr. Uh, Maya uh, that comes on and tells us she's been studying critical race theory. She teaches at Loyola Marymount and she comes in and she tells us, now that's based on this. That part is, you know, something that um, is probably how you grew up and that sort of thing. We have another scholar, Glenn Singleton. He comes in and gives us the tea on like, yeah, that's called privilege or that's not. <laughs> yeah. And we had another scholar that jumped on for the Martin versus Kendrick and just explained that what nihilism is and how Kendrick comes from a very nihilistic point of view of like no allegiance to anything, nothing matters, it's all about money. But he also gives the context that that's part of the American fabric as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not like Kendrick made that up. Right. He, that's he capitalism. Just, that's yeah. capitalism. And so, so it's like, oh, okay. So we start to look at it a little bit differently. So, yeah. so the whole point of them is to heal from the, the conversations and things, but they start as these little water cooler key keys and then they turn into this whole like thing, yeah. how our soul sessions kind of went um, with our, our group sessions. So. Okay, so now typically I would ask at this point in the interview for any Black-owned companies that you are loving, but I feel like Hex Code Black is it. I want to talk about that. Please tell people where they can find those conversations. So Hex Code Black, it's on Spotify and it's well, it's on Apple Podcast as well. Okay. And it's it's just one of those things where you're going to fall in love with the the narrative that we're telling because we're trying to make these conversations, they're heavy. Yeah. These are heavy conversations, but we want people to feel again, like they're healing from it, but they're also getting so many different voices within it. So we've kind of cut them down into like someone's from the South, someone's from the East coast, someone's from Britain, someone's from South Africa. And you hear all these different perspectives kind of come together into one narrative. Rihanna, I'm just so inspired in talking to you. I appreciate you spending a sizable chunk of your morning here with us um, and, and being on Black Tea. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you. And I applaud everything that you're doing. I've been following this for a while and I'm an honor to be a part of this. Thank totally. you so much. I appreciate that. Um, and then for everybody out there that has been rocking with us, thank you so much for watching this episode of Black Tea. Please do go to musebycleo.com slash black tea to check out all the other episodes you may have missed. And please make sure you're following us on Instagram at sip black tea uh, so that you never miss an upcoming episode. And that'll do it for us. We will see you in the next one. Bye.